Hey everyone, my name is Shane Canning and I'll be doing a level design chat today about just building and prototyping levels that I've done in my career so far. And hopefully it's useful just to hear me talk about maybe some of the pipelines and processes that go on at these studios that I've worked at. Uh, and just giving you like a better perspective on how some of us create levels. Uh, of course, this isn't the only way to build levels, but it's just the way I've been doing it. And I'm just going to be diving into some of my shipped work and look at some blockouts and different behind the scenes things. Uh, and hopefully that's really helpful for you to see. So yeah, let's dive into it. Yeah, to start, I'll just talk about who am I? So uh, my name is Shane Canning and I've been a level designer in the video game industry for like 14 years now. Um, I've shipped around nine games throughout that and the studios I've gotten to work at were Disney, uh, where I started my career in 2008 after I graduated, um, where I went to the Art Institute of Atlanta. After eight years at Disney, they actually closed the studio and after that I got a job at Insomniac Games where I spent a little over three years. Uh, and got to work on some pretty amazing projects. Uh, and then I got the crazy idea to move to Tokyo, Japan to work for Square Enix, which is where I am now. That's why I'm recording this session and not able to be there live today. But yeah, I spent two years at Square Enix and then for the past six months, I've been working at Unseen, uh, Ikumi Nakamura's new studio. And I'm currently a senior level designer there. Each of the studios I've worked at so far, I've always been a level designer, and I know that being a level designer or being a game designer can be different per studio, and they've all got their kind of different roles figured out. And so today I'll also talk about what my particular role was at the studio and how we worked, just to make sense of how their production pipelines uh, incorporated design and how the level design pipeline was broken down there. So yeah, let's check out what we're gonna be talking about today. So let's just do a quick overview of the agenda today. Um, I'll be talking about the level design pipelines for each studio and just how my role was kind of integrated with the other departments and how I would work through kind of start to finish on these projects. The biggest chunk of, of content we'll do today is just going over my shipped work, looking at some behind the scenes, some blockouts, and just kind of walking through a little bit of how I was putting those together and just showing a lot of examples of uh, a lot of my work that I've done. And hopefully that is the biggest part of what helps people just kind of not only understand more about what level design entails, but a little bit about what that looks like at these bigger studios sometimes. And at the end, I'll just have some advice for beginners, um, people who are just starting to get into level design or maybe just some advice uh, for how to get started or where to go for that and just things you can be doing to improve. And just hopefully leave you with just a little bit of guidance uh, to where you can kind of start. So let's jump into pipelines. So this is a general AAA pipeline that feels like each studio kind of shared when it came to being a level designer at these places. Um, and then after this, I'll kind of go into a little more detail how each studio might've been a little bit different from each other. But generally we have a pre-production phase where we're doing a lot of brainstorm meetings and we're talking about the game. We're also doing a lot of planning for the schedule and how assignments for levels and kind of responsibilities are handed out you know we're gathering a lot of reference and inspiration a lot of times we'll be thinking about the main references and kind of source of inspiration for the project and what we want people to focus on we're also playing some games and we're talking about games that we think are really good references for the project we also do things like game jams where we could just spend a couple days and work on whatever we want whatever we're kind of thinking would be really cool to add to the project or could help inspire those around us. So you can just go off, make whatever you wanted, and then you'd come back and show everyone that, and it would give everyone different ideas. And some of those items would actually be in the game, and I'll have some examples later on how that worked out. A lot of prototyping, or you're just kind of sketching out in the game engine, whether you're doing stuff in 3D or 2D, uh, any platform that people wanna work on. And then later we moved into production finally, and so you kind of knew what you were working on by then, you were assigned whether you had one, two, three, four, who knows, levels, different mechanics and things like that. But now we're starting to white box out those areas. And so that's when, and some people call that gray boxing, um, you know, white box, gray box, just the block out phase basically of you putting together your levels in the game engine, the 3D space, we're playing around. Um, and then a huge part of being a level designer that I think isn't as popular online or Twitter or whatever you see is the gameplay scripting. And as level designers, taking our white boxes and then bringing them to life. And so slowly, step by step, we're bringing in like enemy spawners and playing the, through the level with enemies or you're setting up NPCs to talk to and mission givers and different quests that will happen. Any gameplay that is happening throughout your level needs to also start getting added in. Studios take that step by step and then iterate on each of those. Um, but it has a lot to do with the story and the mission beats of your levels. 
uh, and this is definitely the time where you see level design just really talk to all the different departments. It's probably my favorite thing about being a level designer is that I actually get to work with all the departments because each team has different parts of the game they're bringing to me to get into the levels and I'm also working with them to just bring my own ideas to life and really leaning on departments like animation and programming for new mechanics as well as audio and lighting and just about every department you can think of really collaborating together and, that, and that's really the difference maker in really good levels is when you have a lot of good collaboration with your teammates. As an LD you'll find yourself actually bringing other people's ideas to life but it's a really big collaboration so you're not really out to make sure all of your ideas get in you just want to make sure the best ideas get in so after those phases we roll into something more of like alpha beta and shipping it so obviously shipping it is just being done with the game but this alpha phase is when there's a lot it's when we're having a lot more play tests and we're, we're doing a lot of changes based on feedback and we're talking to the team and people outside of the team during all this to fix anything we can you know, before time runs out, basically. Uh, it's a lot of optimization, so level design will talk to programming and usually, Different studios have different tools and different teams that help figure out you know, where some of the framework problems are or other optimizations that need to be made. But in this phase, we're cleaning everything up and fixing those. We're tackling all of the bugs that are coming to us for our levels and eventually getting to ship it. And levels, never they're never done really. It's really just someone's taking it out of our hands and saying, you can't work on this anymore. And I find it, it happens like that every single project. So maybe let's talk a little bit about some of the differences from Disney, Square, and the other studios uh, to just see kind of like, to maybe see what was maybe special about their kind of level design roles versus other ones. So when I was at Disney, the big differences with their level design department was one, we were using Maya to build all of our work. And so the workflow was a lot different than maybe just working in Unreal or Unity. And I thought that was really unique. Um, I had a background using Maya from my college days. And so this studio kind of fit me really well. And I was really comfortable just modeling out my block apps in Maya versus kind of building them in pieces, um, which is more kind of familiar with if you're using like an engine. Uh, another interesting thing about working at Disney was we had a kind of more prominent story department. Obviously, we're working with a lot of companies' IPs, and so the story team had a lot of kind of heavy lifting and also responsibility along with kind of decision making when it came to what we were doing for story for the levels. And so basically, when I started projects, I would be given the kind of premise and a lot of the information about what was going on and it was up to me to kind of fill that in, create some fun spaces, but I didn't necessarily have a lot of control over developing kind of the story and what was gonna happen in these worlds. But yeah, for the most part, I was just creating spaces based on what other people were pitching and what would kind of fit into those universes. Um, and so it was a lot more about gameplay and my spaces rather than getting a little bit more control over also the narrative. When I went over to Insomniac Games, it was much different in the fact that they were giving the level designers kind of more responsibility for creating that entire story wrapper. And so when I was creating a narrative, pitching a PowerPoint and coming up with each mission beat for the story, and then kind of going with the story team and having them look over that change things for me help me make sure certain topics or things for the whole game uh, you know with the story overall was still working uh, and then just really you know getting down to some of the details of the script and if it made sense and if each story be kind of like led well into another but um, you got to kind of be the director of your own level at insomniac and i really liked that i had more control over that you know when i was working on spider-man i was able to kind of come up with a lot more ideas and try to get those in and then you know sell the team on that by doing your block out and figuring that out and I thought that was really cool a big change for me at Square Enix when I moved over there was actually not doing a lot of level scripting and mission creation just yet um, it was more about just blocking out things and making mock-ups prototypes and white boxing just different parts of the world and trying to create the kind of shape language the kind of feel the scale the layout uh, of a lot of those areas and I was doing that for the entire two years um, that I was there and so much different feeling from each studio but kind of a similar pipeline that was happening behind the scenes uh, but as a level designer you know we're always creating spaces that are really fun to play in and that's kind of our main objective is to make the mechanics feel really fun and make players feel like they're awesome doing 
the game's mechanics, basically. Yeah, so it, it can really be broken down to be that simple. Uh, so that's kind of how the pipeline stuff worked. Hopefully that will just give you uh, some context as we talk about the levels I've created and and when we're looking at this behind the scenes stuff or some, some the blockouts and whatnot, um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of context and I hope that uh, helped a little bit. So yeah, let's start taking a look at uh, the fun stuff, the, the games. <laughs> so my very first project at Disney was working on Bolt, the Miley Cyrus John Travolta movie. And it was a blast and it was also kind of nice because it didn't kind of throw me into the deep end. Um, There's a little bit of onboarding, I had a mentor. And basically what I was doing was collision work. Um, back then we, the level design team would actually do all of the collision for the world. Um, that's a lot easier these days. I feel like now artists are doing the collision on their own and we generally do more bug fixing rather than creating anything from scratch. But yeah, I was just kind of covering all these different levels that needed collision passes. I was taking assets and destroying them in Maya and breaking them up into pieces, as well as just little tasks that were getting me familiar with how their engine was integrated into Maya and how all the tools worked. And so uh, I didn't have any levels of my own for this one. So the next game I worked on after Bolt was finished, uh, I rolled onto a project called Jabberwocky. And uh, sadly, this was a canceled project at Disney, but when I was interviewing to come to the studio, this is the game they kind of pitched me on to say, this is what you'll be working on. Uh, and I spent around eight months doing some of my first kind of game design work. Uh, and I got to block out a lot of different spaces that I was assigned. There was this awesome blur trailer that we had made. And this was really cool because we got to turn this into a playable space. And during that time, uh, the kind of work I was doing as, as a level designer was putting together a lot of different combat camera areas. Um, the game kind of had some rail camera stuff going on and so the cameras were on rails as the player moves around those spaces. And I got to work a lot with creating kind of like boss scenario areas. Um, just prototyping like cool like levels I was dreaming up and so for the first time I was actually blocking out spaces and it was really fun to put these levels together so it was really sad when the project actually got cancelled and I rolled on to Toy Story 3. So yeah, and Toy Story was an awesome project. Um, I had so much fun learning about the things I should start caring about as a level designer because a lot of the things I've learned in my career have all just been on these projects. Like I didn't really know anything about it coming out of school. I was actually uh, trying to be an environment artist. And so Disney actually thought I would be a better level designer than artist, which is at the time I was like, oh no. Um, but it's been more fun ever since I started it. And I've obviously stuck with that the whole time. And so on Toy Story 3, there were just a lot of cool opportunities to um, script some gameplay and start kind of prototyping different how mechanics would work. Um, worrying about platforming now where I'm thinking about the rhythm of platforming and how to make that comfortable for players uh, and how to kind of put mechanics together and transition those into situations that are kind of understandable and fun for the player. So with some of these puzzles that I had made um, with timing or you're there to help some of the other toys escape from their jail cells. And all the while, Buzz Lightyear is patrolling the world with a flashlight. And so I actually used uh, 3D cones and had them slave to Buzz and slave to the other elements like the helicopters that move these lights and the cars. And when they touch you, when the player touches those cones, then they get caught. And so um, looking at the block out I had done in Maya, this is like early on. Um, one thing I'll tell people to do as you're doing work is save work in progress as much as you can because I swear for the first couple of years of my career I just never even thought about it so a lot of this I had to really go scavenge and, and really try and find some of this work in progress or behind the scenes things but yeah we got some of the project from Pixar and they, we got to see what kind of these daycare centers looked like in the movie and then from there you're looking at different pictures concepts stills whatever your company whatever your project is kind of showing you to build off of, if you have something, you know, you're kind of looking at and trying to think about like, what is this space going to look like? Uh, and so I built out a block out. And from there, this was the first time I got to really work really closely with a game designer because at Disney, they also split up level design and game design where in Insomniac, it was kind of like you're both. And it was really fun to just, yeah, dream up different things that were happening for this. Um, so, Woody and Jesse are able to kind of swap back and forth and free the player. And so you could do fun things with having one take over the other and 
um, different abilities mattered and how you could use those in the level where Jesse could use certain mechanics that Woody didn't have access to and vice versa. Uh, and so you're just thinking about how you want to spread these things out and make it fun for the player to explore around and, and have these things happen. Um, and I think it turned out okay. I think looking back, I don't know why this kind of a level maybe took me too long to put together some of this stuff. And it's just kind of fun to think about, you know, how you might go back and do some of these things differently. And then, and this whole presentation has really made me think that way. I'm just like, oh, I wish I could just make this again. I would do it so differently or I would make things so much better because a lot of the spaces are kind of like the car lights intersecting with each other, like it becomes a little ambiguous. Um, and just you start to see little things that you'd want to change or try again uh, because when you're developing levels uh, it's really all about communication you know there's just so much feedback and things you need to tell the player whether they're doing things wrong or they're doing things right and it's just really fun uh, when you look back at things like this and you're like how did some kid like because you know, the demographic at that time was so much younger and so how did how did someone i had how did i expect someone to be able to accomplish this um but it, it worked out somehow and so yeah there's like these glowing red buttons around these prisons and so um another cool thing that we see in level design a lot is kind of players see the solution and then kind of trace back their steps um, to find out what they need to be doing and a lot of times it could be piping or electrical wires in this case you know so you're kind of drawing you're retracing the steps to say, oh, this is where I need to go to try this out. Um, so yeah, it was really fun, really cool. I learned a lot. Um, you know, it was my first full project uh, at the studio, and I think uh, I started to finally kind of understand all the things that I need to start looking out for. You know, whether it's where am I putting collectibles, and I'm getting to work on different cameras and implementing those uh, to give the player feedback when they're doing something right or wrong, uh, as well as you know, you're thinking about enemy pathing and um you know where cinematics happen where story beats can can happen where dialogue gets placed in between things as a level designer we're always figuring out where we're putting dialogue lines and how that's matching up with what's going on in the game so yeah really cool project and um just kind of my first kind of thrown in the deep end like figure all this out and it was a lot of fun though so after toy story 3 my next project was cars 2 and sadly i didn't save a lot of like my block out work or any of the prototypes or any of the work i had done on this so i'll just kind of gloss over it a bit but um it was really cool because it was like the first kind of competitive split screen i had worked on and so uh being a gamer obviously and just really enjoying these types of games uh this was definitely the one of the most fun projects the studio had worked on uh, throughout the eight years I was there is because the entire studio was just constantly playing the game together against each other. We had so many competitions uh, and uh, during this phase for level design we were tasked with coming up a lot of different modes that we could play multiplayer together with. So our capture the flag became like deliver the bomb and uh, my level was this oil rig level and so I was trying to figure out like how to make this interesting when it's kind of on a big square and um, ended up just kind of more concentrating on, you know, weapon placement, uh, just uh, exploders and destructibles and things like that, uh, as well as kind of like enemy spawn stuff, because what we actually did um, is we had somewhat of a horde mode. And so uh, figuring out where my spawn closets were to deliver more new enemies, and as well as like the waves and, uh, you know, with visual scripting, that's usually how we're managing our wave numbers. And so this project taught me a lot about that and I was able to just get better with scripting in the engine, um, figuring out that at the time Disney had developed their own engine and in that engine was something called Meridian and Meridian was kind of our visual scripter. And so that's what I'd used for every project um, for pretty much the whole time I was at Disney. Uh, doing that you know and, and it had a lot to do uh you know with um if you're not familiar with visual scripting you know a lot of it is like based on connecting uh events to other events and different actions that the player is doing in the world that then triggers other things to happen right and so we're just managing things step by step as well as keeping track and uh, keeping score uh and just able to trigger off cinematic sound dialogue and events and everything in between uh, and so this project i got a little more familiar with doing that uh, so i definitely recommend if that's something you're weaker at to you know keep practicing uh, and try and script a lot of things on your own at home and look up tutorials and things and, and just keep getting better at um, being able to prototype different gameplay whether it's modes like these or any small mechanics that you can get into and kind of showcase uh, it's really strong in portfolio work when i see candidates that have you know some blockout skills and they're they have a technical side that helps um, 
you know, they have a technical side that also shows that they're trying to do this type of work because that's what you'll be doing at the studios most of the time. So that's really what you want to show people. Uh, next up was Disney Infinity. Um, this was a big deal for the studio. We created this kind of a new big property where we start plugging toys into and different properties. We got to work with all kinds of different studios like Lucas and Marvel. Um, but yeah, for Disney Infinity 1.0, I was assigned as the kind of lead level designer on the Cars playset. And so basically that meant I was going to be blocking out kind of a, my version of Radiator Springs and trying to figure out what kind of fun gameplay would be there. Sadly, another case of I don't have a lot of work in progress stuff um, that I had saved from this time. Uh, I don't know why I did, didn't grab anything like that. Uh, the cool thing was when I was starting to prototype this project, we had kind of a different car model that we were using as far as the physics go. And lightning could just jump all over the buildings and stick to things and wall jump. And it really felt like we were almost doing like parkouring with cars. Uh, it was really wild and pretty fun, but eventually we kind of settled that down a little bit into more what you um, see in the final edition. But we could still like do grinding and tricks and jumping all over the place. And the basis around my prototyping was just trying to figure out how to incorporate these buildings into the gameplay and doing some racing around Radiator Springs. Um, but we also had another level designer put together uh, a bunch of racetracks that would happen in a different area uh, for Willie's Butte. And so those were kind of the two areas for the Cars playset that we had. It was really fun trying to figure out how to make these different buildings do cool things and talking to the game designers about what we could try. Um, you know, as well as like finding these different mechanics that we had had like towing cars and what we could do with those and chaining that together and then throwing the cars into these buildings and having things affect them like paint jobs and customizations. Uh, and then past that just coming up with like interesting races and creating the different tracks around the world to do those And yeah, so it was just really cool kind of creating different challenges races uh, Gameplay around the town of just hanging out with some of the NPCs and getting missions from some of the main characters of the cars universe prototype your best ideas and uh, Even if they don't work out they're more often than not really good food for thought for other people on the team to come up with their ideas that can kind of like plus one on yours so this is cool. So on Disney Infinity 2.0, I got to work on some laboratories and sewers and was able to scrape together some of the, the kind of files I had worked on before. Um, but it was really cool. So this was the Spider-Man playset that I worked on mainly. And so I had this cool lab where you kind of like defend the computer that kind of had a central hub area. And then we would just be spawning a lot of... Uh, enemies until the timer ran out you just needed to defend the computer uh, and so also part of this level was grabbing batteries and powering different doors so you can go in and out of things here's a little bit of how the blockouts looked um, with doing that kind of stuff and you can kind of see the conduits of the batteries uh, of where they get placed and the setup for the computer and things like that uh, and back then when I was doing a lot of my blockouts um, you know I've, I've always been the type of person because like I said I was kind of coming from trying to do environment art uh, into level design so I've always kind of been like a wannabe environment artist where I'm just really wanting to you know you try and define the space as much as you can uh, in my opinion this is a topic that is very different depending on the level designer you talk to and which studio you work at and how their kind of team puts things together but um, yeah sometimes you can keep it simple and sometimes you can you know try and add a lot of fidelity and make things look really interesting and cool um, I feel like that will help inspire people around you and also just get people excited about your ideas. I think that's the biggest point of all of it. It's just you really need to build things in a way that get, can get people excited about what you're making. Uh, with this level I'm showing now, uh, this level actually got cut and was never finished just because we kind of ran out of time. And it, sometimes you get to a project and they're like, look, art can't finish it. So we have to cut some things. And this is one of those things that got cut, uh, which is a shame. I really liked this one because I had these cool hex puzzles on the floor that you were messing around with. I did put those in the other labs that I had done. Um, but yeah, generally just putting together gameplay, this is how it kind of went, you know, in Maya, you're just blocking out uh, your scene and trying to figure out, you know, these different areas and how they connect to each other. Um, I think that's one thing I've just learned so much more about is just composition and how I'm kind of stringing areas together and then also how I'm defining each area and how that could kind of lead into the next and what you're trying to set up for the player to understand where they are in the space. You know, there's a lot of different things we can do. Um, that really helps players kind of figure out, oh, I'm here and then not getting lost. And so you want to create memorable landmarks. You want to create different areas that have an identity uh, and that they stand out from each other, but that they also work really well together cohesively as like kind of one big space. 
So there were things happening in the labs with batteries and in the sewers it was all about walking around with kind of this big sonic weapon that would uh, blast these uh, symbiote walls apart so you can keep moving forward. It was really fun to work with Marvel on Spider-Man uh, and it was kind of funny that later I would work on Insomniac Spider-Man and I, I hope that this maybe came in handy with uh, pulling me into that studio. Uh, so I was really thankful to get to work on both of these. So then I went to Disney Infinity 3.0 and this was a blast. So working with Lucas and doing a bunch of new Star Wars stuff, um, it was just a ton of fun. And so the crazy part about this project, um, level design wasn't able, or no one on the project was really able to see any of the movie, right? Um, but we could see screenshots of it basically, um, but we couldn't take those anywhere. We just had to look at it and then remember stuff and then just go work on things and try and create something fun. Uh, and so for the prototyping for my levels here, I was doing Hans Freighter and the Starkiller base. And so for the freighter level, I was just trying to, you know, make something that kind of looked like a big smuggling ship um, where Han and Chewie could um, store a bunch of cool things. And a lot of the prototyping around this was just really trying to figure out uh, some of the shape language of Star Wars and making sure that was there. Uh, and also just kind of to imagine like what would make a really fun space in the Star Wars universe uh, when it came to like what my mission beats were and kind of coming up with like this little story and just coming up with stuff that made sense for Han and Chewie as well as uh, Disney Infinity stuff. Like for some prototype pieces, you know, in the beginning it was just kind of putting together a few simple hallways or walls in different areas, um, you know, landing ship areas, just to kind of get a sense for it. You might see, um, I hope this is something anyone who is already in level design, but yeah, always have like reference cubes for scale. Um, a lot of times nowadays I just have different models I can use like um, to scale and I kind of spread them around my level and just make sure I'm always constantly checking scale against anything I'm building. And so yeah, early on here, I'm doing a lot of testing with just like figuring out like, oh, Star Wars stuff, like what can I put together for this? Um, kind of the, the docking bays where levels would start um, for the Starkiller base. Um, and then for that level, you know, I just really got to go to town and it was amazing because for me, uh, Lucas had reached out and told us like, oh wow, the Starkiller base really felt like you know, something that would fit the movie and fit and fit the universe uh, and, and gave us a lot of like kind of compliments on what we had done with this from not really being able to see any of the reference too clearly, um, especially for this part of the movie, they didn't have a lot of that to show. And so, yeah, this was just a lot of fun, you know, creating different, um, different elements where like stormtroopers are walking by. And I think my favorite part of this level was uh, creating this like really huge tower that went all the way up because I wanted this elevator to just be screaming down by, by the player. And as you're crawling around it and collecting different things and fighting people, uh, that, that elevator kind of had this like cool Star Wars feeling to it. Um, as well as um, towards the later part of the level, there was another kind of, um, kind of vertical room that you made your way up and I it was called the oscillator I believe uh, it's been a while so I don't remember but this was really fun for me just because you know you have like the different mechanics for Disney Infinity so we have the pipe climbs and the wall hanging stuff uh, you know and then just the fighting with the enemies and so you had to kind of figure out like how to make that fun and so you're going around and I think you were like disarming bombs at these pipes and so you would disarm those as well as fight these people and then use the pipe climb to, to get up higher and things like that and then you kind of dip into different areas and fight um, and eventually leading to like a boss fight with Kylo so uh, that was really cool um, so the final Disney Infinity that I got to work on was called the Finding Dory playset and this was technically Disney Infinity 3.5 but it was kind of got launched in a kind of softer way and it was kind of at the end of uh, kind of what we were working on for Disney Infinity stuff and this one kind of went out kind of fast and so during this prototyping and blockout phase you know I got assigned to do this 3d coral reef um, bay area and so when I started the project I sketched a couple of things uh, for trying to figure out what I wanted that space to look like uh, and then I usually just go in and, and start blocking things out I'm not super big on kind of 2d maps or sketching out uh, things too much because I just I'd rather spend more time in the, the game engine in the editor trying to build those spaces up and then iterate on those instead but yeah for this space you know I was just trying to figure out like what was fun to swim around in and creating like just a bunch of different routes and things like for Dory to go explore and find. And so the premise of this level was you're at the MLI Institute from the movie. And so the fish are on the outside and it was all about building up your coral reef and 
just making it like super fun to not only be there but make it super nice to look at and so the player is unlocking just a bunch of different things that can add to it and then also building these different kind of um kind of landmark house areas um that do a lot more like fish customization kind of like similar to what we had been doing with the Disney Infinity in general when you're in like the toy box mode. There was a lot of customizations and things like that. You know, it was really just about creating a fun space uh, for the fish to be in. And I thought the challenging part to this was sometimes you're not gonna get VO support, so voiceover. And all of the side missions in here were just going to have text. And that's kind of how Disney Infinity worked. The main missions had all the VO from a lot of the actors in most cases. And then all of the missions we were doing for quests that filled in some of the side stuff uh, you know, just had text and that was really difficult because different children at different ages don't necessarily read the text, they just kind of button through it. And so then your challenge is just making sure you're presenting the levels uh, and these missions and things you want them to do in different ways to make sure that it's always like clear enough and, and it has like some visual representation. And that's why in a lot of games like these you'll see a lot of like waypoint markers and so we turn those on and off and make sure that the player like kind of always knows where they're going at all times in these types of games. Where I think if you see games, you know, that are with higher demographics, uh, you have a little more leeway to kind of not only get more creative, but challenge the player to not just like hand them the answers uh, as easily. Another cool thing about this was we designed one of the houses um, for the cuttlefish to f turn on and off and change the time of day in here. And so you had this really cool kind of fluorescent uh, nighttime vibe versus the brighter daytime. And I thought that was really awesome to have like two completely different looking areas. Uh, as well as when we were prototyping, uh, this type of things we had mechanics on the d-pad so you had like a shrimp that could eat algae and you had a cuttlefish to light up dark areas uh, and it's really cool to have some of those mechanics and that's kind of the stuff we you would prototype right you're trying to think of like okay what kind of game mechanic can I not only build in the engine but then you know relate that to what the game you're working on make sure it fits within the theme and has like a kind of a fun gameplay hook that can be repeatable and so that's a lot of the stuff that we get challenged with so after Disney closed down, um, I left the studio. Uh, Warner Brothers picked up the studio and kept a lot of the people, which was really cool. But I decided that because I'd only worked at one studio, I wanted to try and work somewhere else. And I ended up getting a job at Insomniac Games. And I think it was amazing. It's uh, definitely one of the best studios on the planet, uh, hands down. And so my first project obviously was Spider-Man and so Spider-Man was uh, such a blast and like I had mentioned before now Insomniac is kind of having level design um, you know own game design level design and be a director of their own missions and levels and really kind of take control of those and figure out a lot more than I was used to figuring out on these other games but it was also really fun because now for the first time I'm in a room where I'm trying to pitch like the overall kind of picture of the entire level and so we put together like a PowerPoint presentation, uh, you know, just get all the team in the, in the room with you and you kind of pitch that to everyone. You kind of say, okay, here's what I'm thinking for the story beats, you know, each kind of uh, location for the level and how the kind of uh, narrative plays out and each, uh, you know, thinking about tutorials and how you introduce those. Um, because with tutorials, it's really important that you can kind of tie those into the game a little bit and they're not just something that's thrown at you. But, um, you know, it's not always perfect because a lot of times new tutorials pop up later in development and you have to kind of find a place to put those and then you're kind of backtracking and figuring out you know where does this fit well enough and how can I tie this maybe into a cinematic do we have the resources for that uh, and so with my block out with this tower uh, it was really fun because when I first thought of this level I immediately was thinking of that movie The Raid um, where you have a SWAT team kind of infiltrating a hotel hideout and then making their way up into these floors and trying to clear them out. And so I thought with Fist Tower being this big fancy office building that I wanted to kind of lean on something like that. We weren't going to be able to swing in this kind of an interior, but I wanted to still make Spider-Man feel like it was important that he was Spider-Man. And so you're able to kind of you know, propel yourself up to these higher areas and keep moving across. And then usually in level design, we try to do something where we don't ask the player to kind of do harsh 180s all the time uh, to kind of like lose focus on where they need to be going. It's kind of always kind of this linear fashion or at least doing things that get that to be closer where I'm not turning 90 degrees and maybe I'm doing something that turns me 45. 
and then another 45 to kind of do these left to right turns. Uh, but in this case, I was going to have some heavy duty 180 degree turns. And so knowing that, I just made sure that each section kind of had an event or something, whether it's a cinematic or uh, effects and explosions or a new enemy or something, uh, you know, pulling you in that direction to kind of reorient the player so that you would know where to go and kind of point you in the right direction. Um, and so I thought that was really fun. Uh, another amazing thing on this project, I got to make the level for E3 2018, uh, which was the raft. And with this level, you know, I really got to dig into some cool things with creating some new mechanics for the player, um, which was kind of this big vertical shaft at the end of the raft level where I wanted the player to be running up. And when you hit dodge to just kind of change the platform you're standing on uh, while continuously running upward uh, at Electro. Uh, and this was really cool just to come up with like different mechanics. Um, but usually for level designers, um, we don't usually come up with more than just like one thing per level that's like the special out of bounds thing just because resource wise it would be really crazy not only to teach the player this 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 many new things but also for the team to consistently be doing kind of one-off things or things we're not sharing with other parts of the game uh, and so you really as a level designer need to manage your resources and figure out you know what do I have access to what can I bring in that's new to my level and exciting but is still in pace with like the overall scope of the game uh, and so you know, we really fight a lot with that because we're always trying to get some really cool things in, but they're like, hey, pump the brakes on this part, but we can give you this thing, you know, or how many cinematics can I have? And that really dictates, you know, these kind of big, bigger moments that will happen in the level. And you're just kind of juggling all this stuff to kind of come up with something that's really compelling, but didn't kind of kill the team at the same time. One of my favorite things to put together for Spider-Man was this electro chase on the outside of the raft, because I got to really kind of prototype a lot of like moving parts falling, uh, you know, and kind of dictate a lot of the points on where Spider-Man was going to kind of keep propelling himself to do the chase you know, what kind of uh, pieces around the level are available to you. And then as level designers on Spider-Man, we are constantly having to do markup on any place that was point launchable um, and swingable. And so I can show a little bit of what that looked like in the engine, but we're creating volumes in the editor that dictate where Spider-Man can swing from. Uh, and then we're also creating different point launches specifically. Uh, and in this case, I got to really mess around with, um, you know, falling towers and things like that and actually being able to swing off of those and, and move on those. That was really something really cool that came out of prototyping um, from when I was uh, tinkering around with that. And it was just really fun getting to be the one to actually play through the video for the, the raft level and kind of show exactly how I intended the level to be played. There were cool examples, you know, earlier on where we were trying to slow things down a bit and it was a little more puzzly, where Spider-Man was in a room that Electro just kind of rushed through and created a lot of electricity and water mixtures and so it was a lot of things like kind of electrified, so stay off of this and that, and so slowing it down a little bit in this case. But then when E3 came about, we were like, okay, we need to ramp up the momentum. Let's make this just like a parkour section to transition to a cinematic. And so a lot of things like that happen all the time where we're constantly just kind of iterating and changing things and when trade shows or things like e3 come about you know you really have to look and see what you're presenting and you know if it's the right pace uh, for that kind of environment it's definitely probably the most the thing I'm most proud of at this point uh, in my career so far yeah another cool thing is just uh, you know as a level designer we're also tuning the AI and figuring out what they're capable of and so working with programming and getting what you need out of those scripting nodes to control electro and, and then you know, working with them to figure out how we can use that scripting, you know, what kind of things we should pull out of programming into being visual scripting and what we can leave behind the scenes as code um, is also something we kind of juggle with. But definitely having that responsibility of authoring each point Electro goes to waiting for Spider-Man to close that distance, you know, detecting when he's in range and then having Electro pull off actions like whether I fire shots at Spider-Man or I fire shots at parts of the environment to make things fall and collapse on you. So it, it was all about just trying to figure out that kind of mixture of, of excitement um, so that the player would really feel like everything's kind of coming down around them and Electro's a really strong and powerful enemy. Uh, and so you want to make the player feel that. So. Yeah, it, it, it kind of ends up being pretty crazy what you're responsible for coming up with there. And I think that's what uh, is the most amazing thing about being a designer at Insomniac. You just have a lot of power to create the kind of game you want. And the team there is so top notch, you can actually do pretty much anything. My last ship project was Ratchet and Clank. And so something really cool I got to work on um, early on, we did a game jam. And for my game jam, I kind of wanted to put together this 
spooky underwater base because that was kind of the theme I was more latched on to and I really wanted to make that for the game. And so, um, you know, later this level would become Cordelion, but this was just a prototype of some uh, different ideas and things I wanted to show off. Um, but from this game jam, I was able to kind of present like, here's what I'd like to work on for the game and build a level that I was just kind of dreaming up for the Ratchet universe and then later getting to build a level that was kind of based on that game jam idea and I thought that was just awesome that that's how that kind of works out with game jams because another thing that happened you know one of the lead programs at the time uh, for that game jam uh, put together this spider bot that was like procedurally animated and so after the game jam and everyone would present their ideas I saw what Adam Noonchester was the programmer um, he put together and I was like this is what I want to do for a mini game you know I don't want to do kind of any kind of 2d puzzles I think we should you know make this kind of stand out as more of like a cool little action sequence for the mini games um, or some of the you know side puzzles whatever you decide to do and so from that game jam idea that he had I put together this which was kind of a, a playthrough of you being like the spider tank and Ratchet was like controlling it um, through like maybe a computer interface system or something like that and just trying to make it a level that kind of felt like I was a spider and I can crawl around and do different things and so you're collecting these data packs and destroying parts of the level and just creepy crawling around like a spider and so the cool thing is this later you know got after I had left the studio because I only worked on this project for about eight months you know with a little bit of pre-production and production and um, you know that became that became uh, you know one of those modes for the the side part of the game. There was uh, two kind of side kind of game quest things that they had. They had the the clank puzzles and then these glitch ones. And so they gave it a name. They themed a little bit more story around it and you know made it even cooler than this. And so that's why I just love about this type of thing where you can come up with these ideas and the team is able to just keep making things better and better. Um, and it's just awesome to see how game jams can turn out this way where you can kind of. The team's prototyping a lot of cool things that end up going into the game but it gives you a lot of freedom to just kind of come up with whatever you like so one of the levels i had started to do some prototyping on and was assigned was i went through a whole powerpoint pitch and pitched this whole level for blizzard prime and this was going to be like a destroyed planet maybe like half lava half kind of iced over you know abandoned uh, desolate kind of thing and so this was like a super early prototype of me putting some of those ideas together um, this was like not even a first pass yet uh, as far as like kind of scoping down the spaces and figuring out the scale it was just kind of like a jumping in and putting something together and trying to figure out what this world would be um, pitching the team on the narrative beats and working with story to figure out you know what made sense for that all that ended up getting changed after I had left where a lot of the story had changed and they had kind of pivoted and you know iterated on their own ideas right and so as that happens levels will change and that just kind of goes with it um, so some of the other designers I'd worked with kind of took over and redid a lot of the space. So Blizzard Prime wasn't really anything that had to do with me anymore other than just kind of food for thought um, ideas that I had presented before I had left. Uh, but the cool thing is the Cordelion level, uh, which I was really proud of, um, you know, mostly stayed intact. And so a really cool thing with this level was, um, you know, I got to see how this turned out. And thinking back from that game jam, I don't have any footage of this, but Mark Stewart, uh, the lead designer uh, on this project, was, you know, put together something or like kind of chasing us through the spooky space. And so we took that and uh, made it happen in this Cordelian level with this uh, character I named Juice, because he's always after like the energy sources, um, was chasing you around the the world uh, and it made it feel like you know alien isolation a lot of the inspiration I took from this was like the thing uh, aliens um, and, and just really wanted to make it feel like a lot different and spooky and, ha and there was just so much life you can do with like underwater things and I think uh, this whole theme it, it just really feels cool to me and so uh, some of the art in some of these clips are already put in I, I, I was looking around for some of my earlier block out stuff um, but this was still what it looked like uh, you know before I left uh, and so yeah, you're just trying to create some really fun gameplay uh, The really cool thing about working on a ratchet game is that a lot of this stuff is kind of like existing And so we were able to port over a lot of things to get us going with the prototype phase and the early production phases And so you do have some enemies you can spawn to kind of like feel out combat zones You know you do have some of those mechanics that are already working and then there's new new mechanics Like I think I had one where you punch a raft and it blows up and then you can use that as bounce pads um, You know you're doing things like scripting junk bot. I was kind of coming up with just junk pop character he's like this scared guy that um is kind of following you around the level and so trying to create all the splines and making sure you're managing where he's going the whole time is something that you know is a lot of work to do as well um 
you know, there's just a lot that goes into creating these experiences. Uh, and it's, it's pretty wild when you get to see them come together, uh, especially when art starts to team up with you and start bringing your level, um, you know, further up in those passes of the art. And uh, it just blows you away every time. It's just uh, nothing is better than seeing how your block out gets translated into what the game will look like. It's really, really exciting. So yeah, I had a lot of fun working on Ratchet. It was like short and sweet. And then I just had a new opportunity to go to Square Enix. Um, and the sad thing about Square Enix is that it's all under NDA, obviously, and so I don't have anything to show for like the two years I was blocking stuff out there. But as I mentioned before, at Square, it was all just about, you know, mostly just doing blocking out. And so I wasn't doing much scripting. And that was like a kind of a new thing where I wasn't taking as much of a role in some of the game design and scripting like I had been used to for the last three years at Insomniac. So yeah, let's talk about advice for if you're just starting off level design or you're curious about things or just how you should go about getting better. The biggest thing for level design is like how well you can work in the engine and create spaces that are like really fun and playable. And so I just recommend that you're spending all of your time in Unreal or Unity or a game engine of your choice, uh, as well as maybe picking up some skills that can help on the side of like a 3D package, like if it was Blender um, or if you know Maya. 3d max and all those other things but um it's not a must-have but it's just like a really good thing to have in your pocket uh, for when you can use those another big resource that has kind of come up recently is a discord channel called the design den and i really recommend as you're starting to put together your first spaces to post your work there and get feedback because there's an absolute ton of level designers and game designers on this discord channel and they're just constantly providing people with portfolio reviews they're chatting live with people and just talking about their work together and so I think this is the best resource we have right now for level design uh, and it does have a lot of game design elements in there too there's different sections for that but it does touch on game design as well as level design it's just a massive resource where you can network with people and it's something that wasn't around when I was getting into level design so I just think it's like a it's just a huge resource for people to get started with not necessarily needing to go to school um, schools get to kind of be up to you uh, if you can afford school or if you want to you know jump in and do it uh, it's there and I think it's helpful and it's nice to kind of see something that big through but at the same time schools you know it's really expensive and so I think now you have more specialized things with like what I was teaching with CGMA um, you know there's a lot of different courses you can take through them places like Nomen um, you know animation mentor these type of more specialized schools that can kind of teach you exactly what you need to do for your job and then you can just go make a portfolio and try and do that um, and so if you are gonna do school I definitely recommend doing something more specialized like that and so yeah you just got to be in the engine building levels and then getting feedback on those um, the most important thing is to create a portfolio out of all of that and once you have a portfolio you can start applying to places obviously but um, like I said the design den does a lot of good things like giving people feedback and critiques on their portfolio websites um, you know quality over quantity is always key uh, and just don't ever show anything on a portfolio that you don't think is your best work because I've seen a lot of cases where um, we start to second guess a lot of people uh, based on we're seeing like a lot of different things another huge thing is don't confuse people about what you want to be so if you want to be a level designer your portfolio kind of needs to reflect that in a very strong sense um, I won't dive into too many details about what portfolios need and everything, but yeah, just make it very clear of like level designer, game designer, technical designer, these kind of categories of design, you know, you really need to specialize in most cases. There's a lot of caveats or, you know, you can work for maybe indie studios or places that do allow you to be more of a generalist, but that's kind of not how things work these days. Um, overall uh, and more often than not studios are looking for people who specialize in that so um, that's kind of my advice when it goes to that when it comes to a little bit of level design advice scale is a huge thing when I was just starting off I feel like scale was the one thing I was constantly getting wrong everything was always too big so just constantly having reference for character sizes in your worlds and just checking that um, as well as just constantly playing what you're making so after a few minutes of creating something you know jumping in the engine and just checking checking your sight lines checking your composition just constantly playing your own work maybe having other people play it once you're far enough along and then just iterating based on that feedback and then just being really critical of yourself of a lot of times as we're making levels we have all the information we know exactly what to do and that's why playtesting is so important because someone who doesn't 
know exactly what you've put together and what order you know can come in and play it and then you can start to think about how you're communicating to them if that's working out you know and then how you can change that and how to make things stand out um, when maybe people are, are completely missing something you thought was very important um, so yeah it's really just about communication you know getting really strict with your scale and making sure that that's always feeling really good um, trying to create you know super creative layouts that offer a lot of interesting compositions uh, it's very important to think about the flow of your level and how players will gradually move through that space um, if it's more of like a 360 open world type of environment you know just thinking about every angle someone can approach your spaces from and how they might deal with that giving them different options and, and just making sure that the mechanics and the options players have are very obvious. So I do teach a level design course at CGMA. Uh, this is a 10 week course that kind of takes you through a lot of the basics all the way into like doing combat and just has a, just a ton of information about, you know, what it takes to create levels and what they need to entail. So that's the end of the presentation and uh, yeah, I appreciate you sticking around and, and checking it out. Hopefully seeing a lot of examples of all of the work I've done over my career uh, really helps you get a better perspective of how a lot of this stuff gets made. As well as hopefully it was helpful if you're already in the industry and you just get to see a little bit of behind the scenes work from some of the studio stuff. Um, I always find that really interesting when I get to see some of that for Blocktober. Um, if you don't know what Blocktober is, it's a hashtag on Twitter where you can see a lot of uh, blockouts from people's work for level design. So if you if you haven't checked that out that's definitely something to take a look at you need to get in touch with me anytime um, here's my LinkedIn QR uh, you can add me on Twitter uh, and like I said I teach a course for CGMA so feel free to reach out to get more information about that or check their website as well uh, yeah thanks a lot